I'm Chad. I'm known in the SCA as Duncan, uh, often called Duncan the Monster, whatever. I am a soldier of the Mid Midrealm Dragon. I am part of the Midlands, regardless of where I live, and I am a captain of the Gold Mace. So as previous to the SCA in the United States Army, I was a military trainer and I participated in what in the U.S. Army trade uh, or training in Army Doctrine Command called USD or Unarmed Self-Defense. So the goal of our course there was to take all of the martial arts ever recorded, Eastern and Western, and distill them down into a lesson we could teach an Iowa farm kid in less than three days to give them the basic primer in it. And the methodology we used there was to base everything we taught in human biomechanics as well as all of the intrinsic human abilities we have for violence, because most people don't think we do, but we do. So let me see, can I share a screen? I can share a screen. So I'm gonna do a, a presentation slideshow here with some images as we go. So you should be able to, is that the right one? Nope, that's the wrong one. Hang on, I'm doing the wrong screen. How do I go back? How do I go back? Which screen well, are you guys seeing? Are I you guys see seeing? Back talk, section one biomechanics presentation. Oh, you see the presentation one? Okay, good. I want to make sure we were saying the right one. All right, so from the human biomechanics of violence, what is one thing that all combat systems have in common? That is, they all use humans. Every martial art, regardless of where it comes from, whether you're talking about karate from Okinawa or you're talking about Muay Thai from Thailand, it's people fighting people. The basic rule of martial arts is use a human to break a human in seven seconds or less. So we have to use humans as our baseline design. All humans, regardless of culture, gender, background, and conditioning are built on the same basic blueprint. We are bipeds with two arms, forward facing optical systems, and the same kind of brains. Physically, we can break the human being into two basic systems, those being the upper body and the lower body. Now these two systems work together a lot, but functionally, they are distinct enough to where we need to talk about how the lower body system and the upper body system different in their, differ in their function. So let's talk first about the, the lower body system. One of the most important things we have in our lower body system that is importantly distinct is we have the way our pelvis, femurs, and knees are shaped. They're markedly different than any other mammal, including our closest cousins, the great apes. One of the ways that they're super different is the way our pelvises are shaped. This is a gorilla pelvis here on the left, and this is a human pelvis here on the right. If you look at our pelvises overall, they are much narrower left to right in the side and much shorter north to south or top to bottom. But the biggest difference is the way our femurs are shaped. Most femurs of most terrestrial vertebrates, especially our primate cousins, are very straight up and down and the head of the femur is almost directly in line with the line of the femur. Humans are different in that our femoral ball has moved offline. And what this allows us to do is to have our femur be captured, first of all, by a full osteo joint. So your femur head is actually enclosed in bone in your pelvis. And that moves your pelvis head closer in line with your knee and your ankle which not only centers your center of gravity right between your knees, but also allows you to maintain your bipedalism. Now, another important part about the way our lower body works is we have to talk about the human foot. Our foot is dramatically different than any other terrestrial mammal of any kind. Our foot has an arch in it that is created through our metatarsal bones and all of our tendons. But the biggest thing that it does other than allow us to be bipedal is it gives us a ground strike energy return. It's a big shock absorber. We actually get between 60 to 75% of our energy back from every stride that we make. And human bipedalism evolved to be a system where one foot is constantly in contact with the ground. We move the, another foot forward, it shock absorbs, and off of that spring back, we move the next foot. 
So it's the most efficient way to walk ever, to, ever evolved. Not to run, that's an important distinction. There are lots of terrestrial animals, especially most quadrupeds, that can outrun the crap out of us. We can't catch them. If you ever tried to catch a chicken, you know how hard that is. But nothing outwalks us. Nothing alive can outwalk us. Let's talk about the upper body and how that is basically two subsystems, your arm and your shoulder. Now, in the human arm, most people think they understand how their arm and wrist works, but a lot of people don't. Your arm, I'm going to talk basically from the shoulder to the wrist, are made up of three long bones. You've got your humerus, which everybody knows is your funny bone. It's the top part of your arm where we normally wear our rebrace. It's your bicep, tricep area. Then we have the ulna and the radius. These are the two bones that make up your forearm. Now, your ulna is the bone on the outside opposite from your thumb, and it is fixed connected to a certain degree from your, at your wrist and your elbow, all right? Your radius is connected on the thumb side on your wrist and your elbow, but the radius is unique in the way our arm works. Everybody put your arm out straight at the camera like this. Now, rotate your wrist. Are you doing that with your wrist or your arm? That's happening because your radius is actually transitioning over your ulna. You can't actually rotate your wrists like this. That's not your wrist joint. That's your forearm bones trading places inside your arm. All right. There are three joints in your elbow. Those joints give us flexin or flexion, which is a bicep curl. It gives us rotation. which is this, and the wrist has a joint made up of basically a bunch of bag of bones in jelly, and it does not rotate. You think you can rotate your wrist, but you can't. Your wrist only has flexion. It flexes this way, and it flexes this way, because this is a unidirectional joint, but you cannot rotate it. Every time you think you rotate your hand, you're not rotating your hand. You're changing your forearm arrangement, all right? This is where a lot of people get confused about the way your upper body works. When we get to the shoulder girdle, things get really strange. There are only two bones in your shoulder. There's your clavicle, which is your collarbone right here in the front, and your scapula, which is your back, your shoulder blade. What's important to know about the human shoulder is we do not have a rigid connection. There is not an osteocapture like our pelvis, where we have our femur and our pelvic girdle fit inside of each other like a ball and socket. And the shoulder is often referred to as a ball and socket joint, but it's actually not. Your humoral head is not captured by your scapula. The only thing that connects this is muscles, tendons, and bursa. Bursa are just like little bags of apple jelly that ex exist as lubricant. This makes your shoulder extremely unstable. We have to remember that we as primates did not evolve from brachiators. Our shoulder girdle is very different from a lot of our other primate cousins, especially those that are arboreal, like gibbons and other animals that use brachiation or swinging from tree to tree like Tarzan. Our shoulders will not do that. You can do it a little bit like when you're a kid on a monkey bar, but that's not what we're developed to do. So the thing that's important about your shoulder is you have to understand where the strengths of our shoulder development lay and where the weaknesses are. If you, because it is unstable, it gives us a large range of motion, all right? We can go all the way across the chest, we can go up here, all of this stuff, which is a lot more range of motion than most other vertebrates. But it also leads to damage to the shoulder, especially from repetitive and violent action. And those most common injuries are from least severe to most severe, is you get bursa wear. You wear the little lubricating sacs, and that's what you see as bursitis. A lot of fighters and people who do repetitive motions, especially sports, any kind of sports injury, you'll get bursitis, which is basically a wearing to the lubricants. Tears in the muscle. Everybody who's been around fighters has heard the, the sentence, I tore my rotator cuff, or I need rotator cuff surgery. When people talk about that, they talk about the rotator cuff like it's a singular item. It's not. It's four muscle groups. 
There are four muscles that make up your rotator cuff. I'm not going to go into listing all of what all of them are, but and they all connect different for different angles. All right. The other injury you can get to your shoulder, and you people do this a lot more than you think you do, and you come closer than you think you have if you don't know that you've done this, is dislocation. It is very easy to dislocate and relocate your shoulder. Again, because it does not have an osteo capture, we have no way to connect bone to bone connection. Okay, everything is done through muscles and tendons. So let's talk about range of motion and how we need to approach it as far as doing repetitive motions like fighting. Our shoulder range of motion, while broad, is strongest closest to midline. Our shoulder joint is stronger here near the center of our body than it is out here like this or above our heads or behind us. These are the weakest places we can put our shoulder because it puts the most stress on the joint. Most stable position and the best joint capture is here towards our center line. Adduction, which if you look here on the right of the image here, I have all the different technical terms for shoulder movements. Adduction is where you take your shoulder from its neutral position across the front of your body at like a 45 degree. This is actually the fastest movement our shoulder can make because it's the shortest distance to travel. We don't have to take it from its neutral position into a weird position or push it out. And it also is the least amount of joint shift. We're not rearranging the joint. When you raise your shoulder, you're re realigning the, the position of your clavicle and your scapula and making all those muscles move. Horizontal flexion, which is bringing our arm in a straight line from out to across our midline, is the strongest and most powerful motion we can make. And that's because it uses the largest amount and the largest individual groups of shoulder muscles. Okay? The rotator cuffs as well as all of the muscles in your chest, like your pectoris and, and stuff, and in the back, the deltoid and the laterals. All of that becomes involved in this movement. So this is the most force we can make and this is the fastest, if that makes sense. So that's the biomechanics you need to understand about the way you want to use your shoulder. Now, I'm not going to go a whole lot into in this class, there is a lot of stuff in the handout for this, about the spine as a body system, other than to just basically say it's the bridge between the lower and the upper body systems. Our spine is not straight. Everybody thinks we have straight backbones. We don't. It's actually a giant bunch of S-curves. I'm not going to dwell on it a whole lot other than to say just accept that your spine exists to basically link your pelvis girdle and your shoulder girdle together as two Legos with a unidirectional set of ball bearings. Having covered all the osteomechanics and, and everything else about how we stand, let's talk about, or how we're put together, let's talk about how we need to stand. Before we even enter a fighting position, we need to find what's called neutral posture. A neutral posture is where we have our spine aligned vertically, we're standing up straight, our shoulder girdle and pelvis girdle are in alignment, which means we have them in as neutral position in the joints naturally as possible, but they're also in line top to bottom. We don't have our shoulders turned off of our hips or our hips turned off of our shoulders. So shoulders and hips are in a line right over our knees, ankles, and knees and ankles, all the way down. Basically have all of the joints of your body straight down. Now, the thing that a lot of people miss, and this is not like what people think when they say they get told to stand straight up or stand up straight, everybody's inclination, because we've been trained to do it socially. Oh, I think Lucy just got her speakers. Yes, <laughs> I saw your face change. Okay, don't put your feet together. You want to have your feet naturally fall into a position about hip width. That's a natural stance for humans, all right? So once we find the neutral position, we're going to move into how to move out of it and how we need to move our bodies. And to do all the movement, we need to talk about muscles because muscles are the movers. Your mu muscular system is made up of a whole bunch of bundles of fibers and cells, and muscles can get very complicated. I'm not going to talk about ATP and glucose exchange rate and lactic acid buildup and all that other science crap. 
We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about muscles in a very broad overviewing sense. Now, the one thing I want you to remember is that muscles cannot pull or muscles only pull. They never push. You think when you push something, you're pushing with your muscles, but you're actually not pushing. You're pulling against it because we are a system of levers and pulls. All right. There are three basic types of muscles in the body. There's cardiac muscle, which should be pretty plain from its name. That's your heart, obviously. Yes, even I have one. There's smooth muscle, which makes up all your organs and other body structures. It makes up stuff like your eyeball, your stomach, your thoracic cavity lining, all the systems that exist in your body to allow you to keep functioning as a biological forage. We're not going to talk a whole lot about those because, well, they're involuntary. They're going to do what they do for as long as you're alive and never listen to you at all. They don't care what you want to do. They have a job and they're going to do it. So we're going to talk about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the only voluntary type. It's the only type we can actually tell to do things and they'll sort of kind of listen. There is a lot of autonomic responses that your skeletal muscles make. For example, when you're in your neutral stance and you're trying not to move anything, there are loads of muscle contractions and actions going on, minute, minute little adjustments to keep you upright and bipedal. All right, let's talk about the types of muscle movements that your muscles can make. Again, they never pull, they only push. So let's talk about how, these work, how this works. There are three main muscle contact or contraction labels I'm going to use. That's concentric, which is it sounds complicated, but I promise this is going to make sense. Concentric is when a muscle gets shorter to exert a force. In this animation GIF right here, we have basically an animated GIF of a fore, uh, an arm doing a, what you recognize immediately as a bicep curl. When the arm is coming up, when the forearm is coming up, the bicep is making a concentric motion. It is getting shorter and shrinking swelling to create that force to lift your arm that's what that muscle is doing so it's pulling your arm up by by getting shorter eccentric is when a muscle gets longer to exert a force as your arm is coming up again in the upward arc of the curve and your bicep is getting shorter to exert a force your tricep the muscle in the back of your arm is extending or having eccentric contraction. And what it's actually doing is it's pulling itself together this way on this angle, right? It's not pulling the ends together, it's pulling the sides in to grow, to also exert a force. So when you do your arm up, you think you're, normal people, people normally think that's a bicep action and only their bicep is doing it. Your tricep is also involved in that action through eccentric reaction. Another type of muscle contraction we don't deal with a lot is it's isometric. Isometric is where your muscle creates tension, but doesn't change shape in order to, con to apply a force. This is as simple as holding your arm out. When you hold your arm out still from your body, you're doing that with isometric action. Your muscles are tensed, resisting the force of gravity. These can be as simple as that, but if you put a weight in your hand like a weapon, when you hold your weapon up, that's an isometric force, all right? Is all this making sense to everybody? Nothing strange? All right, so that's basically the biomechanics section. Does anybody have any questions? Did I tell anybody anything they didn't know? Was this all covered in your high school science class and you remember it? Is this helping? Anybody? Give me feedback. Good? Good? Somebody's talking. I was going to say, it is helpful. They just didn't cover it in science class. Okay, because this is something you need to understand if you're going to use the human being to create violence. So violence as a sport is something we're all here about. And again, the core thing is violence by humans requires humans. Now, before we go into economy of violence, I want to talk real quick about muscle contractions and the way I'm going to say we need to approach them. 
a lot of trainers in physical sports, especially in anything that requires explosive action, like we do in SCA combat, especially in armored combat, where we're looking to bash our opponents. But it's also something you see in baseball, weightlifting, gymnastics, all of which are things I've competed in, things where you need to create an explosive action. You'll hear a lot about isometric loading. You think you don't, that sounds really complicated, but you all know how to do it. I want you to either try or think about this. When you stand, you're isometrically forcing your muscles to hold you up. Isometric loading is different than stands. So if I'm standing, this is an isometric action, right? But the minute I squat for a jump to leap, that's an isometric load. When I squat down and I tighten my quadriceps and my calf muscles and my core muscles and all of that and prepare for that jump, that's isometric loading. Does everybody understand that, what I'm saying? A lot of trainers talk about isometrically loading your blows. So if you're going to throw a boxing punch or a sword, a sword blow, not a, a cut, but a blow, you'll have a lot of people talk about tensing up all these muscles previous to. Kind of in, instead of doing a wind up, do an isometric tightening of all these muscles and prepare it to spring out. That makes sense from one point of view, but I'm not as big a fan of it as you would think on another side of it. Because to me, a very important thing about that is our economy of violence, which we're gonna get into in one second. The other thing I wanna talk about is the fact that, just like we saw in the slide on muscle contraction, you have muscle con concentric action that usually creates a force in movement. All right, but you also have an eccentric action working counter to that. Most of the time that's to smooth the action out because if I didn't have my tricep also doing an eccentric action when I curl my forearm, what would happen is there would come a point where the muscle contraction of my bicep overcomes the inertia and the gravity holding my arm down and it would not curl up, it would snap shut like a mousetrap. Nothing, 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 nothing. We cross the threshold, snap, right? That's bad for your joints. It's bad for you because it's really easy to punch yourself in the face or hurt yourself. So you have an eccentric action that helps slow and smooth that motion. You also have a trained physiological response to stop yourself from punching things. However old you are, minus about 14 months, you learned that when you run your hand into a wall or into something when you punch it, that hurts. So your body automatically uses breaking force to stop a strike. When you punch something in boxing or in just regular fighting or when you throw a sword, your body has autonomically learned to slow that swing to decrease damage to yourself when you're trying to damage your opponent. If you don't think this is true, you've never actually done any physical fight training because when you try to train to punch a heavy bag or to punch a speed bag or to punch another person, you automatically begin to slow that punch down before you strike, which is why sober people who punch a wall don't break their hands, but drunk people do because the safeties slip. Sober as you are, walk up to a brick wall and try to punch it as hard as you can, and you never will because part of your body is going to go, whoa, 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 cowboy. We don't need a broken hand, and it's going to try to stop you. You're doing this whether you're conscious of it or not. There are two ways to defeat that in basic mechanics. One of them is to train repeatedly to learn what you can and can't take, and also the addition of safety equipment. The other one is very simple mental trick. It sounds stupid, but it actually works. Change your visualization of the strike. When you punch something, do not punch to the surface, punch through it. You will always hear people talk about follow through. Follow through this, follow through that. And they'll always talk about how you need to let the joint, you know, complete, make the art complete itself before you recap, 
look, don't strike to contact. Strike to contact plus two. Visualize your point of contact not being at the surface, but being two inches deep. It's a little mental trick you can use to trick your safety brain into not understanding what's happening and going, oh, we're okay, we can go that far. All right, does everybody get that? Is that it? Okay, so let's talk about the economy of violence and why I am not a fan of isometric loading and why I am not a fan of some of the methodologies of fighting that you see out there. I know we all use the term calorie in a different way when I say calorie, I usually mean kilocalorie, which is not what you mean when you look at how many calories are in your Snickers bar, but whatever. I'm just going to use calorie as a colloquial vernacular term. So just think of a calorie as a unit of energy, and every Snickers bar has X number of calories in it. When you consume them, your body now has that conversion of energy. So we all have a fuel tank. We all have a limited resource or capacity for calories. Each action you take from keeping yourself alive by respirating and your heart beating to physical motions and actions requires calories. It's going to burn a portion of that fuel reserve. All right? Just standing still, upright and awake burns calories. There is a finite amount of energy available to you at any given time. Being alive, you're burning it, and you only have so much. You're going to have to burn calories to eat calories to have calories. I want you to visualize this calorie reserve as a counter, like an odometer. All right? So every action causes a tick. Tick. A rollover of how, much, how many calories you have available for any given moment. All right? As the number in your, the fuel tank level decreases, the um, amount of calories or the, the ratio of calories taken for every action from your reserve increases. For example, when my tank is full, me just standing there costs a negligible amount. It costs one calorie a minute for me to stand there when I have a fuel tank of 100. So I can do it for 100 minutes, fine. 80 minutes later, when I've burned 20% of my calorie reserve, it's not going to cost me one calorie anymore. It's going to cost me three. So every minute I'm standing, it's going to cost me a three out of my 80. So the ratio of cost increases as capacity decreases. It is a diminishing return curve that steepens exponentially as you get lower. Okay? Do not spend your fuel reserves recklessly. Do not commit to actions that do not have a purpose. That's not to say don't do things that don't have a purpose, but make sure you understand the purpose of the action. Violence cost. Spend wisely. Okay? Does that all make sense to everybody? I... I want to take a break real quick. I want to take any questions or comments anybody's got to make sure that I, you've all got it or if you have anything that wasn't clear or if you have any inputs. Because again, I'm not saying I'm a, the ultimate subject matter expert. I want to hear from you guys too. So I don't know how to open this up. I don't know if you guys are muting yourself. It sounds good so far. Okay. Anybody else? No? Sight, sound, or movement? Everybody's good? <laughs> hey, I see you. Um, all right. So that's pretty much the first portion. And again, I just wanted to cover the biomechanics and make sure everybody's got that. Now, unfortunately, I'll be honest with you, I haven't built as much. Oh, hang on. Let me change something here. Yeah, that get over here. You get out of that. I haven't built the second portion as much as I would like. It's still kind of a work in progress. So let me close this. And I want to open all of this up. Nope, that's not what I want. I want to be able to see you guys. There you are. Sorry, I'm doing having technical difficulty on my side. Okay, so this is going to, uh, I tried to make this first portion of the slides less reedy and more showy. 
Uh, this part's going to be a little bit different and that I haven't trimmed this down as much as I would like right now. So I want to cover stance and movements based out of and growing out of the biomechanics about how we need to apply that. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I am not creating a system. I am paring multiple systems down. I have spent time studying not only every recorded Eastern martial art, you know, what we can find of them, and there's a lot of them, from strip mall taekwondo to competitive Muay Thai. I have also studied most Western martial arts, both period and modern. And I have tried to find commonalities, places in which they all have overlap. Now, if you, a lot of people in the HEMA community, basically, <laughs> do I got a kitty or somebody else got a kitty? <laughs> okay. A lot of people in the HEMA community seem to find a particular school of thought or a particular manual they like and study that. So you have people who study Fiore or the Bolognese schools or George Silver or Meyer or whatever. And I'm not going to say they slavishly attempt to reproduce those, but those become their primary field to study. Especially in the HEMA community, a lot of people are working at trying to get as close to the recorded manuals as possible. We see this with people who study I-33, Myers, all of the other schools. The SCA is a unique living archaeology experiment in that we are using some of that, but also making a bunch of crap up. Now, we talked before about how all, all games in, of violence include humans, but we also have to talk about the intent, rules, and purpose of the combat game. The SCA, especially in the armored community, we are not actively training for combat combat. We are training for a combat game. Now, this combat game is based on combat and is attempting to, as closely as we can, simulate combat. But I'm never going to say that someone who can do the SCA awesome is going to be great at life or death zombie apocalypse because those are two different things. Train for both, but understand what the SCA is. Yeah? Yeah? Okay? Everybody good? Okay. So let's talk about how I, I want to approach making a base stance for SCA armored combat specifically and why I think this is the best stance we can get to because it is the one that takes the most commonalities from all the variant systems and uses and lives in the overlap. So unfortunately, I'm going to ask everybody to do a small prep, uh, participatory exercise. So if you can, I want you to get to a place where I want you to stand. All right. So we're all going to stand up. Might stand up. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to enter, your, enter a neutral stance. So stand with your shoulders square over your pelvis, pelvis over your knees, knees over your ankles, hands at your side, thumbs in, just resting on your hips, right? This is neutral stance. You can bend your knees a little bit if you want to load up, but this is human neutral. Now I'm gonna talk about what I, wanna, what I call the neutral fighting stance. From your neutral stance, I want you to step forward with one foot. Doesn't matter which one you want, but before you step, look down and notice your, the width of your feet when you have them hip width apart. You want to step forward about that same relative distance. So step forward with one foot, whichever one works. Play around, figure out which one you like better. Okay? What you'll find is naturally you want to bend your lead leg to where your knee comes into line over the toes of your lead foot. If you just look down, you're doing it. It's going to go from your shoulder, pelvis, your knee, your front knee is going to come forward and it's going to be over your knee. All right? I don't know if you can see my legs. But when I step forward with my lead foot, it kind of falls into place to where my knee is in point over my toe. All right? This is your basic neutral stance. Now this is important. I want everybody to look down at their stance. Fall into your neutral stance. And I want you to look down and everybody whose back foot is turned out more than 35 or 40 degrees, raise your hand. 
okay? Because it's a lot of people. That's a natural thing for you to do is to turn your back foot out. Here's where I'm gonna become heretical. You can sit down there. Here's where I'm gonna become a heretic. I think that is a bad choice, specifically for SCA armored combat. Do not turn your back foot. Turning your back foot is a normal thing that we do because we've been socially conditioned to, to, to think it's what we do because that's what we see in art. That's what we see in culture as far as a fighting stance. Oh yeah, Bruce Lee, right? That's what everybody does. Do not turn your back foot out. There's reasons why you want to do that sometimes, but for SCA armored combat specifically, don't do it. The reasons you want to turn your back foot out in a fighting stance is when you are doing things like deep lunges for a lot of point centric fencing and other stuff like that, or when you are going to do voids and throws in martial arts like judo, hapkido, aikido. Okay, that's when you want the back foot turned out when you're going to take a force coming at you and you're going to redirect it. That is not what we're doing in SCA armored combat. In SCA armored, armored combat, we are pushing force directly ahead of us or from our relative point. We're not going to go straight line into our opponent, but we're pushing force forward. We're not taking force at us and deflecting it. Additionally, turning your back toe out like that, because most of what we do is done on this angle for both adduction and horizontal flexion, because that's the movements our shoulders are going to make. We're actually lengthening the air, the length, we're increasing the distance we have to move a blow to reach our opponent. You don't think it matters, but turning that back foot anything more than 35 or 40 degrees out adds two to four inches of distance that you have to cover with your shoulder. Turning your back foot out for the style of strike that we throw in SCA armored combat, regardless of your position, whether you're doing Bellatrex, school, old castle, A-frame, a doesn't matter. That overreaching, I think, is responsible for a lot of the repetitive injuries that we see in SCA armored combat to the shoulder, to the knee, specifically the ACL and the MCL tears, because you're overranking your knee left and right and, and not in the plane in which your knee joint is supposed to move. We are twisting our knees to overreach that distance, and we are wearing the bursa and rotator cuffs out of our shoulders. And it's as simple as that 30-degree turn in your back foot. All right? So repeat after me. Toes in the work. Keep your toes forward. Do not let that back foot turn away. Now, you want to. It's natural, it feels good and stable, and when you point both of your toes forward, it feels awkward and twitchy. Trust me, drill this. You will immediately notice a difference, all right? So we're not gonna go into a whole bunch of that. I, I am gonna talk real quick about your hands. Everybody, when you fell into that neutral position, I want you to just, you don't have to get up. Put your hands in a fight position. We're gonna fight, ready, set, go. What most of us do is we end up with our hands like this, and if we're standing, a lot of times our, our non-dominant hand is lower. Human condition, our, our intrinsic ability is to take our primary hand, whichever one it is, right or left, and it usually settles between the point of our chin and our throat, this triangle. Your primary hand instinctively covers this. Your lower non-dominant hand falls lower and covers your abdomen and groin. This is what we do. This is automatic human, right? Notice that this is midline of the torso, close to the shoulder, and your elbows are down. This is what we automatically do because this is what mechanically we're made to do. You don't automatically fall into a fighting stance like Wing Chun because this is not natural. This is not something that gives you the leverage you're made to do, and again, not to say that this is dumb, there's a system of combat that works very effectively out of Wing Chun, absolutely. But it's not, well, for Wing Chun. It's not, <laughs> I hear Eric going, no. <laughs> it's not what 
It's not weed. Weed well, it's not weed. Yeah, okay. It's more animal, but you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a cool. It's whichever one it is. I don't. It, I learned it from Jeet Kune Do, so I don't remember what the name of it is. Yeah, okay. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I come to it from from Jeet Kune Do, so it's kind of already mixed up all together in my head. Anyway, that's valid for that style, but that's not applicable to the broadest range of humans. This is where we normally settle, and there's a reason for that because it gives us the greatest mechanical advantage. So make sure you don't turn your back foot out. I covered all of that. This, we just did this. All right. So if you read period manuals, how many, how many people have been studying one or more period manuals? I know a few of us. Most people, like I said, generally settle into a manual that they like and they kind of stick there. They sprinkle in some other stuff now and then. I'm the opposite. I have one manual I really like reading, but I very rarely use any of it, and that's George Silver. Because George Silver, okay, here's a, reality, here's a realization I came to about 10 years ago, trying to study all these period manuals. Most of them are not about sword fighting. Most of them are about fighting while you happen to have a sword. Because about 40% of the manuals boil down into how to get to and secure the grapple and then take it to the ground. Either kill them immediately, bind them, grapple them, and then kill them. George Silver is the best example of this because he literally has no cuts. It's this is the block, this is the one cut, and then you kick him in the cot. Block, cut, block, cut, kick. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the way we need to. So a, a lot of manuals talk about more about footwork than about sword, sword work. Not to say a lot of manuals don't have a lot of sword work in them, but a lot of them focus very much on footwork, especially in your later stuff when you get into the Italian schools and the German schools. I'm going to simplify what I call my approach to footwork a lot. And a lot of this is going to be very recognizable to people who have looked at any manuals, especially anybody who's looked at Meyer and other stuff. So the three basic st steps I'm going to talk about are the passing step, the gathering step, and the expansion step. I'm probably using this differently than you're used to hearing the terms, but I'm going to define it. A passing step is where, in our neutral position, you have a lead foot, in the front and you have a trail foot in the back. The passing step is literally where your trail foot becomes your lead foot or your lead foot becomes your trail foot. You are exchanging feet as you move. This literally is the human stride. We are walking. And again, as we are learning biomechanics, that's what we evolved specifically to do. It's the one thing we do fantastic that everything else does, yeah, okay, All right? And again, this is helped by keeping our toes straight because that way we don't have to step, we don't have to turn our foot and step forward or turn as we step forward. And we don't have to worry about turning whatever foot becomes our trail foot. So we wanna keep our toes mostly in line and be able to trade either one, all right? That's a passing step. And again, you know how to do that because everybody here knows how to walk. The gathering step is a little strange in that it's kind of the accordion step or the shuffle step, where basically, you, for whatever reason, you want to maintain the lead trail arrangement you currently have, okay? And the gathering step is just that either your trail foot comes to your lead foot and then your lead foot expands, or your lead foot comes to your trail and then your trail expands. It is literally a shuffle forward and a shuffle back, okay? That's the gathering step. What you're doing there is you're not changing your lead trail arrangement. Some people only feel comfortable throwing a sword blow or a strike or a thrust or whatever from a certain foot arrangement. There's no reason for that other than that's their comfortability. But you should be able to throw a strike from either foot forward. It shouldn't really matter. Different strikes from different feet, but you should be able to be a foot. Anyway, if you want to maintain your lead trail arrangement, 
So the most simple step is gather, 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 gather. The key to a gather step is that your feet come together at some point. So you're narrowed and then step out. Kind of the other version of that, the other mechanical way of doing that same thing of maintaining your lead trail arrangement, but changing your distance is an expansion step where whichever foot it is, lead or trail springs out and you open your stance a great deal and then you reassume the stance. So you can either do a gathering step to where you close your feet and then open your feet or an expansion step where you open your feet and then close your feet. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand that? Okay. That's literally it. Those are the three steps. There is a slide, what I call a slide, which is basically just slipping. Your one foot or the other, lead or trail, comes off of whatever your line is, goes to a different place, and then you rearrange. It's just a slide. Just moving side to side. You're not really using a slide to change distance. You're just using it to change angle. Does that make sense? Everybody got that? Okay. So, the next part of the class is going to be the two o'clock class, which is going to be where I'm going to talk a lot about measure and distance. What I wanted to cover right in the first portion is how we're built, how we move, and how we should apply them. So, did anybody learn anything they didn't know or have a different way to think about anything than? than they've approached before, or am I just repeating noise that everybody knows? The feet in alignment helped. I, I've heard it before, but I don't always remember that. Yeah, I don't either. Believe me, I don't either. But seriously, I'm going to tell you right now, toes into work, huge difference. From and practice. Yes. Because that's Everybody. not natural. <laughs> it, it is natural. It, it, because it's better efficiency, but not well, like where your brain goes. The, the trick that I use to get there is to just think about your fighting stance being a stride, you walking forwards or back, paused. It's literally one cell of an animation cycle. Nice. Your, your, your movement in and out should be as naturalistic as possible. It shouldn't be a system you have to force your body to do. What your body wants to do is pick up one foot and put it in front of the other and constantly walk forward. So your stance literally should just be you walking forward and back on pause. So I rather like having that. to come from an unnatural position into your natural stride, just take your natural stride and pause it. It might also keep the movement up because if I when, as soon as I go back, I want to stop. I'm like, oh, right, I'm stuck. You go, you go back because and you're not you're moving. Stuck. Yeah, you're, and you yeah. Stop. You're just okay. You're, your fighting stance is literally just you moving forwards and back on pause. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Come on, somebody else. Uh, so with that, in wrestling, um, we were taught a very, a very similar thing. Your feet need to be as close to, you know, straight as possible. Part that's important with that is you're getting more load from your feet because if your foot is turned out this way a little bit, you're not directing all of your energy to where you want to go. And that's a really important, like, key thing to remember. And, like, when you're doing strikes and stuff or if you're fighting or wrestling or whatever it happens to be, you can notice the difference right away in the amount of power you get by your stance. Right. If your feet are straight, any leverage you're creating is off of the ground. If you turn your, your hips out of line, any leverage that you're getting is out of your hips. You're pushing off the joints of your hips and your knees before the ground. Yeah. And the, the ground's a lot stronger than your knee. And doing that a lot really fucks up your hips. Yeah. yeah. As, somebody, as somebody with a hip replacement, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that has to hurt. Well, it hurts a funny word. All right. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I, was, I found like the muscle loading part really interesting. Uh, I know Christian talks about how. Uh, if you want your arm to go and it's already tense, you have to relax it and then tense it in a specific way. I, keep, right. I, I thought your explanation like uh, played into that really well uh, and me like hitting yourself in the face. But there, there is a there is a methodology you can do to isometrically load for a specific action. 
But before you can do that, you have to intrinsically understand what muscle does what action and actually develop the conscious ability to tighten individual muscles. And that is something that takes years of training. We don't know how to do that. If you think you do, if you think you can move individual muscle groups completely voluntarily, I want you to stand up moving each individual muscle as it's needed. <laughs> I am now going to tighten this muscle and cause this joint to turn this way so that I can just try it. Just try to walk across a room by moving individual muscle. It's possible, but it's freaking hilarious to watch people try to do it. Like, just take your hand, put your hand up, and move just the muscle that's required to pull your index for finger forward. The one muscle that does that. You're not. Because if you look at your forearm, your forearm is moving. There's a muscle moving here. There's a muscle moving near your thumb. All of this shit is interconnected. You can learn through years and years of practice how to isometrically load the specific muscle or muscle group required for a particular action. But before you can do that, you also have to learn how to counterman the automatic eccentric contraction that's trying to create the break. And the key to that is understanding that we move, every, every bone in your body has at least two muscles attached to it, usually especially anything skeletal, loca any locomotive muscles. They have a muscle and it's counter. You have a bicep and a tricep. You have a pectoral and a deltoid. Sometimes you have more. But every, remember, muscles can't push. They only pull. So everything that moves in more than one direction has to have at least two muscles because it's got to have a muscle to pull it this way and it's got to have a muscle to pull it this way. Isometric loading is not a bad thing to strive for. However, it is a bad place to start from. Work more on controlling the eccentric contraction that is trying to put the brakes on you. You want that eccentric contraction because it smooths it out, because it keeps you from throwing your arm forward so fast you dislocate your elbow or your shoulder. And it stops your forearm from coming up and punching you in the face. Because, I mean, and how many people think they can put their finger in a mouse trap and move their finger before the mouse trap closes? I tried. Did you pull it off? No. Okay. If you didn't have your tricep working counter to your bicep, that's what your arm curl would be every time it happened. Okay. So you're right. I know I've talked, Craig Stan and I have talked before about isometric loading. And again, that gets much different when you get to contact. When you talk to grappling, isometric loading is totally a thing you need to worry about because again, isometric is just exerting a force to counter a force, not to overcome it, to stabilize it. So when I hold a weight out in front of me, whatever it is, I'm not trying to lift it, but I'm also not letting gravity have it. So I'm applying a force equal to the force being applied against it. And when you get to grapples and you try to do joint traps, you need to get very good at isometrics as far as maintaining control of other people's muscles. Does that make sense? Okay. Good feedback. Yay. Who's got more? Give me more. I love feedback. Nobody? Everybody good? It's what's been your, good. Thank you. Okay. What's your thought on being continuously in motion? Because I've seen you like practice fight a couple times and it doesn't look like you're always moving, but you're pretty consistently moving either forward or backwards. I do a lot of that primarily because I'm a buckler fighter. I don't have a passive defense. I don't have a 26 or 36 inch wall to hide behind. The yeah. only thing I have as defense is can't touch this. And I have <laughs> to be constantly moving, but I'm having to weigh that. If you also watch me fight, I'm weighing that against the economy of violence. I am doing that when I'm at a distance where I've got to worry about you actually hitting me. If I'm at a distance to where no matter what you do, you can't hit me. I am the laziest son of a bitch you have ever seen. 
Yeah, I, I know. Rest my, I will rest my sword on my neck and my buckler will hang loose or I will look like I am taking a nap. But if I am at a distance where I've got to worry about what you're going to do to my body, I got to be doing things. And we're going to cover that a lot more in the next section because in the next section, we're going to, at the two o'clock class, we're going to talk about measure and distance. And we're going to talk about, uh, measure is made up of three components, distance, pace, timing. So we're going to talk about distance, we're going to talk about pace control, and we're going to talk about timing of shots and actions. That's part, part D. And eventually we will get to part tree, and part tree is about my version of the cut drills and the wards and the, uh, the way we need to adjust our understanding of the wards, especially people who study a lot of HEMA and people like you talk about I-33 and wards are not static and don't think about that. The only way you can block a shot is to have your sword in specifically this angle. And if you're off by two degrees, you failed at the ward. That's not the way. And eh, it's another class. I'm getting side sidetracked. All right. So we're coming up on the one o'clock mark. That's about the, the hour that we've got. So again, expect, I hope to see you guys at the two o'clock class because that's where I'm going to cover the next sections of this. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to get at ever the cuts and the wards today. Fair. I want to cover. I do have a YouTube channel of a lot of me talking about a lot of this crap. If you haven't seen that, please check those out. Uh, the handout slides from what we did today, as far as the first portion of the class, what you guys saw was the presentation. There is another group of Google slides of the, of the handout, which has a lot more notes and a lot of the stuff that came out of my mouth hole written down. Cool. So if you want access to that, I'll post it in the event on the Facebook page so you can access that portion of the Google slides. Thank okay? you. Thank you very much. No problem. Again, if anybody's got feedback and you don't want to give it publicly and you want to write an Instagram to me or write a whatever, <laughs> feel free to. I, I live on feedback. I'm not an expert. I'm just an idiot who's thought about this more than is healthy. <laughs> we, we appreciate your obsession. <laughs> All right. So I'll see everybody at the two o'clock class, I hope. Thank you. Good job. Bye.